Praise the Lord, everybody, and happy Wednesday here at the Riverbend Pentecostals. If you ain't standing already, let's just hop to our feet and let's just give God a little bit of praise in the house tonight. Let's just show him a little gratitude tonight. Let's show him a little, a little reverence in the house of God. Thank you, Jesus. Usually on Wednesday nights, we start out with a time of prayer. And I just want to ask tonight if we could do things a little different. I want to ask if our ministers could line up across the front. If you're a minister in this church, come line up across the front, please. We're believers, aren't we? We believe in the laying on of hands and the sick recover. We believe that God heals situations that he takes care of us, that he makes a way out of no way. And I just want to ask you tonight, do you have faith to step out and believe that God is still a miracle worker? If you have faith to believe, step out and let one of these ministers pray for you. Let one of these men of God lay hands on you and let God work through them and be a witness unto you and be a witness to everybody watching. So I want to ask you today, just step out in faith if you have a need in your body, if you have a need in your life. And let's just see what God can do in this place tonight. So God, we want to come to you right now, Lord. We have people stepping out all across this place because we believe that you are still the healer. We believe that you are still the great physician, oh Lord. And God, we want to seek after you tonight, God, because we know who you are. We know the power that you have, and we know the dominion and the authority that you have in this earth, God. You created it. Everything is subject to you, oh Lord. And God, we just want to reach out to you tonight because we know, we know, God, who you are. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for everything that you do. And we just want to seek after you tonight in this place, God, because it's you and only you that we can run to when we're in trouble, it's you and only you that we can call on in times of need, and we just thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
invite you all, but it feels like there is just a pure spirit of praise and worship in this place tonight because we have a church full of people that know that God still works. We've got a church full of people that know that we are all walking, living miracles, wondering about every day, just showing off what God can do when he turns a life around. So many ways that we can worship in the house of God. We can lift hands. We can we can run the aisles. We can shout. We can leap. We can just give Him everything we've got. But one of the greatest ways that we can praise Him is with our giving, because it doesn't just stay here. When we give, it goes out into all the world. We can fund missionaries. We can go and we can we can work in ministries. We can let people go to work spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we give, we can back them financially. We have many ways that we can give here at the River Bend. We have the Givelify app. We have PayPal at riverbendpentecostals.com. If you're watching online, you can mail cash or checks to River Bend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477 here in New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Or we can give the old-fashioned way here in person. Every pan on the front here is fair game on Wednesday nights. So if you would pray with me, we've already felt the hand of God. We already know that he's working his miracles. We already know that he's working in this place tonight. But let's declare faith over this offering tonight with this prayer that we pray around here. And if you're not standing with me, please come on and stand and let's just declare faith in the house tonight. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. I am a tither and I give my offerings. Now bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received my whole family saved and serving god in perfect health and abundance walking in divine favor and blessing i am blessed going in and i am blessed going out and all that i do will prosper in jesus name amen, amen. come and give church
this time we're going to turn the service over and go a little different direction. If we could have Riverbank kids come up to the front, line up across the front here. That's a blessing, church. Y'all would help me pray over the Riverbend kids before they go back tonight. If you just reach a hand towards towards this group of children and let's just surround them with prayer, surround them with the love of God in this church tonight. But God, we want to pray over this class tonight, God. We just want to ask that you would just help them to be able to get something down inside of them, get something rooted down into them. Oh God, I pray that they can learn about your love and what you did for them, Lord. I pray that, that you would just help Help us through our through our teachers and, and through the Spirit just to be able to instill something in these kids, to build a foundation that they'll never be able to forget, God. Your Word says, train up a child the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it, God. And I pray that as we teach every Wednesday night, God, I pray that we can just keep on building and keep on building and keep on building. And then eventually, one day, one day when we turn them loose into this world, they'll know what's right, they'll know what's wrong. They'll know how to serve you, God. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Y'all go on back. River Bend ignited. Y'all can come on up. just a few tonight because we've got some that are at youth camp this week, but we still got a good looking crowd here for the youth class tonight. If you would help me pray over them tonight as we send them back. Lord God, we want to pray over this group of young people tonight. God, I pray that as they're getting a little older, being introduced to more things in this world, God, that they can know they could know your love, God, and that they would have the wisdom. They would start to be able to, to just prepare for what it's going to be like, God. I pray that, that we can just strengthen them, that we can give them the tools that they need to be able to make it in this world, God, that, that they will know that you love them, they will know that we love them, and there's nothing too great that they, that they can't accomplish with you on their side, God. Lord, I just pray that we can keep them safe, God. I pray that we can just guard them, Lord, and that we can help them every way that we can, Lord. I just pray that you would put a hedge around them, Lord, so the enemy cannot get at them. Lord, I pray that you would just help us tonight. Help us teach and help us grow. In Jesus' name. Now go on back, Brother Noah. We're going to turn the service over to our pastor now. And I just want to let y'all know I'm just a little bit jealous of all y'all because I don't get to be out here listening to all this good teaching. But I guess that's what we got the Facebook live for. I can always go back and watch it, but it's better in person. We're thankful to have such a great pastor and such a great man of God. So let's worship and listen to what he's got. Thank you so much. God bless you. You can be seated. Um, we're handing out the handouts, though it's been the same one for the last several Wednesdays when I was teaching, all except for one. We made a few extra because we have quite a number of guests tonight, and we're very grateful for you being here. Amen. Wednesday night at the River Bend, we just basically have church like we do any other time, and uh, uh, God is ministering. I will say that by the help of the Lord, we're going to finish up a series on holiness, which includes the way we think, the way we speak, the way we treat other people, the way we present ourselves uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. 
There is no part of you that the Bible is not concerned with. I believe it's 1 Thessalonians. can't remember the exact chapter and verse, but it said, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. So it, we need saving spirit, soul, and body. Amen? It's all of us. And uh, the uh, so if you haven't been here previously, you're going to come in on the caboose, and uh, but that's okay. Uh, as Brother Richard said, you can go back on Facebook Live and on YouTube, and I think maybe even our website has a, a link where you can watch all of our uh, uh, previous services. I don't know how far back it goes, but it's a long way. And... Uh, uh, I, uh, um, Brother Bazzelli came. We had over 700 people that have viewed that service. Over, I think, maybe 500 viewed this past Sunday service. Uh, lots of people are hearing the gospel. Amen? That needs to excite us. Because without people hearing the gospel, we got no reason for being here. Um, I know people have had a little bit of consternation about Obey Acts 2.38 being up on the wall, but all 4,000 or so people that watched Aaron's funeral saw that. That's right. That's right. That's right. About 3,500 watched Brother Pete's funeral. About 3,500 watched Brother Johnny's funeral and, and other and various uh, weddings and different things we've had here. A lot of people watch them, and they all see Obey Acts 2.38 on it. I mean, I remember when Brother Scott put it on his barn up on Interstate 55. Anybody remember that? People all over southeast Missouri were talking about, what does Acts 2.38 mean? And they were looking it up in the Bible. And uh, it's important. It is the plan of salvation. You learn how to get saved in the book of Acts. Amen? That means literally means the actions of the apostles. And we are an apostolic church, which means just like the apostles. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. Amen? Amen. We got to do it like they did it in the beginning. Okay. Do we have enough handouts tonight? That's what I'm talking about. Brother Shannon does not have much faith in y'all. I'm just telling you. I make five handouts and he goes, runs off 75 and says they ain't got it. But no, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Practical holiness in the everyday life was put into place by God. Thank you, brother. Practical holiness in the everyday life was put into place by God as a manner of setting his people apart from the world and, everybody say and, and. holy unto him. If the Bible mentions it, we have a responsibility to search it out and see how it applies to us and implement it. If it says it, we better be interested in it. If it doesn't apply to us, the Lord will lead us there. For instance, if you got leprosy and you're poor, you can bring a couple pigeons to the priest. That don't apply to us no more. Though I will tell you, been a couple of pigeons roosting on the roof of the river bend the last couple of days, and one of them squalled all day yesterday. Ooh, ooh. Y'all heard that before? Huh? So if anybody's got leprosy, the Lord may have sent your sacrifice. <laughs> if the Bible mentions it, Old or New Testament, I have got to find out if it requires something of me. Because the book says, he hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. You live in this world to represent Jesus Christ. Okay? You and I, we live in this world to represent Jesus Christ. I, I'm not really going to preach, but I'm going to tell you we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. That means we function here on earth as he does. Love 
is what makes us like him. As he is, so are we in the world, 1 John chapter number 4. So, um, holiness is safe. The same boundary that keeps you in keeps other stuff out. Amen? Jewelry, one thing, adornment and ornamentation is what we're dealing with tonight. And don't get sideways because the Holy Ghost will move tonight. Get ready. Get ready. Adornment and ornamentation, how we present ourselves. Jewelry was originally a blessing from God. They had it all throughout the Old Testament because it was currency. Didn't have dollars and cents as we have them today. But jewelry was currency. Egypt gave Israel all their jewels when they left, and it was designed to pay their way to the promised land. Now, that means every place they traveled through, Brother David, they'd have something to pay their way on the King's Highway or whatever the case may be. It was God gave them a blessing in order to pay their way to the promised land. But as they begin to use their ornaments as an expression of pride and even sensuality, I said even sensuality, ornamentation has come to be a sexual thing. People be getting jewelry and putting it in all different kinds of places for you to look at. Well, come on now. I know it's true. I know it's true. I was in St. Louis yesterday. I know it's true. <laughs> and then you get it put in places that you've got to get less and less clothes on so it can be seen. What's the use in having it if you can't show it off? Oh, okay. Don't, don't y'all get nervous because we got guests. I am going to embarrass you, so just get ready. Ain't nothing new. I do it on Sunday, too. I embarrass my mom and my wife every time I preach, just about. But don't worry about it. God began to call his people to repentance by asking them to remove their ornaments. It came to a crisis point, you'll remember, when Moses was on top of Mount Sinai. I want to give you something to study. I preached this before. But Moses was gone 40 days up there. And the people said, he's been gone too long. We don't know what's become of him. And they told Aaron, make us a calf. We don't know what happened to Moses. They brought all that jewelry that the Lord gave them as a blessing out of Egypt and made a God out of it. Because they said Moses has been gone too long. Up on top of the mountain, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, you better get back down there. Listen to what he said. It's in the word. They have quickly turned out of the way. I feel a little Jesus. I want to start operating on his time clock rather than my time clock. If he ain't moved yet, hold on to your horses, baby. He's going to. So, Israel turned into, made an idol out of the most valuable gifts God gave them. And old Aaron's lying behind. Y'all remember that? He told Moses, that's a lying dog, man. He told Moses that they dumped that gold in the fire and out popped a calf. That's in the Bible too. It, he did. He knew better than that the whole time. Okay. Moses went up and tried to plead for the people. The Lord told Moses, I'm done with them. That's when Moses said, well, then blot me out too, you know. And uh, then the Lord said, well, I'm going to let them go to the promised land, but I ain't going to go with them. And uh, the people deeply repented and they proved it. I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you've got to prove you've repented. How do you prove you've repented? Make some changes. True repentance. The, the religious world, in many cases has preached a damnable doctrine of repentance that says all you got to do is say you're sorry. That's a lie. That is a lie. 
And that's why people think that they can be bad every night of the week and twice on Sunday and just say, I'm sorry. That's not true repentance. Repentance means I'm going to change. I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to leave the direction I've been going, and I'm going to start going in the direction he wants me to go. That's it in its simplest form. He told them, bring you therefore fruit, meat for repentance. Repentance shows up in your life. So, the Lord said, I'll go with you, but I want you to prove the depth of your repentance But because I, I don't want you wearing that jewelry no more, Exodus 33 and 5. It's a promised land. We're on our way to the promised land. Promised land's not heaven. Promised land is a deeper, fulfilled spiritual experience. It's when you get in the traces with the Lord, the traces being the reins or being the yoke, and you are doing what God called you to do. You have found your reason for existence, and I believe everybody's got one. You have found your reason for existence and you are walking in high cotton, so to speak, in the spirit. That's what your promised land is. And there will be giants and there will be battles and there will be walled cities there, but they're coming down because the Lord said the land is yours. So God instructed Moses to take up a free will offering. At the top of the list of the offering was gold. They brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets and all jewels of gold to the Lord, Exodus 35 and 22. And they also said, everybody we whoop on our way to the promised land and in the promised land, we're going to take all their stuff from them and we're going to give that to you also. Numbers chapter 31, verse number 50. Now, here's, that's where we got to last week. Now, see, I, this teaching quick ain't no big deal. I just covered a whole week in about five minutes. Don't think I'm going to make a habit out of it. The Old Testament reveals a growing trend against jewelry because every time God's people begin to possess it, jewelry led to or indicated a spiritual decline through pride, sensuality, or idolatry. Everybody say idolatry. idolatry. We fixing to do some teaching and preaching on idolatry. I've been doing some study about it, and let me tell you something, honey. We make an idol out of anything. Oh, it is true. It, I, it's Brother Shannon's fault because last Thursday night in recovery, I started writing that message down on his paper that he gave me. Mike preach it this Sunday. We'll just see how the Lord goes. I want to unpack something in just a minute, but it says every time that God's people began to possess more jewelry because it was the currency of the day. It led to a spiritual decline through pride, sensuality, or idolatry. The prophets consistently portray Israel as an adulterous woman in their relationship with God and the indicators of an adulterous woman without actually seeing her in the act, of course, is the way that she... When you're going to get a man... You don't come off of three days in the cotton patch without taking a bath. Okay? You get decked out. All right? And the way they decked themselves was with jewelry and makeup. We're going to unpack it just a little bit more, too. Now, Jezebel, everybody say Jezebel. Jezebel. She's not just a Bible character, though she was, but she's a representative person in Scripture. And she doesn't represent the devil so much as she re represents a people who have fell out of love with God and fell in love with the world. She represents a, uh, uh, she embodies the spirit of seduction to the people of God, specifically in Israel's history, but it also applies to us. Her name is in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, and her seductive look, which we're fixing to unpack that at the end of this, is consistent with her lifelong effort to seduce the Israelites into idolatry. She not only dealt Israel a blow, Jezebel dealt Israel a crippling spiritual blow, but her spirit is still trying to infiltrate the church in the book of Revelation because Thyatira fell under the judgment of God because they put up with Jezebel. Now, Brother Jerry, it doesn't necessarily say 
that they even cooperated with Jezebel, but it said you allowed Jezebel to keep preaching her message, selling her goods, and seducing people. You can't let Jezebel stay. This is a Holy Ghost right now, but Jezebel shows up in people that don't wear jewelry too. Jezebel shows up in fellas and ladies. But Jezebel's got to go. Jezebel is rebellious. She's unsubmitted. She's a seductress. And she has one goal in mind, and that's to destroy the people of God. Okay. Revelation 2 and 20 says, notwithstanding to the Thyatira church, I've got a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, which I'm not going to have time to pack that out, but they, it, it's a type of priesthood when you eat that which has been offered as a sacrifice. Okay, and they would offer sacrifices to these crazy idols, Ashtoreth and Chemosh and, and others, Moloch, and they would then take that that had been offered to idol and they would eat it as a testimony of their idolatrous spirit. Now I want to add something that's not in your handout. First Timothy chapter four and verse number one. I just want to give it to you to think about for a minute, and I, I, I want to uh, just and then I'm just going to move on. 1 Timothy 4 and 1, the Holy Ghost led me here today. Now the Spirit, capital S, that means talking about the Holy Spirit, God himself, speaketh expressly, plainly, wide open. You don't have to discern it. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Why is it going to happen in the latter times? I can't hear y'all. Got tired of waiting. Okay? We've been here. Remember that? In 2nd, second, 2nd, uh, second, 2nd second, second, uh, Peter, chapter number 3, I think it is, when it said there's going to come people in the last day, mockers, saying, where is the promise of his coming? We've been hearing this teaching forever and ever and ever and ever, and he ain't come yet, so I just ain't sure he is coming. It's going to happen in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed or listening to or obeying to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What's a seducing spirit? What did you say, Brother Larry? The actual word means deception. What is the seducing spirit trying to do? It's in, the, it's in the scripture there. What's the seducing spirit trying to do? Get you to depart from the faith. Okay. Now the faith includes the entire embodiment of the faith that makes up this walk with Jesus Christ we have. It's not just the believing, but it's the entire uh, embodiment of faith. It's the same that is used in the book of Jude when it says that it was when I sought to write to you, it was uh, necessary that I tell you to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered the saints. Okay, some shall depart from the message of the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. What does the word doctrine mean? Teaching. Okay? That's what it means. It means teaching. All right? What is the teaching of the devil? What is it? I'm not... It is. But what is it practically? What's that? What's that? Anything against the word? Okay, that, that's the beginning. How, how do we know what the devil teaches? 
when you sin? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Brother Kevin, and that's a lesson for another time, I can't blame my sin on the devil. Okay? That made a lot of money for Flip Wilson, but it don't hold no water with the Lord. Okay? Brother Jerry, I feel like we sin a whole lot and the devil ain't got nothing to do with it. It's all the flesh. All right, what was you going to say? Now we're talking. Okay. Anybody familiar with the theological term or the uh, hermeneutical term called the doctrine of first mentions? Anybody familiar with that? That is when the first time something is mentioned in the Bible, that's where you have to go to to find out what it means. Don't go to like the fifth time, but it's the strongest impact of the, 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 what, what is mentioned will be in the first mention. Now, what's the first mention of the devil tricking somebody? In the garden. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There you go. Well, let's see what happens in the Bible. It, it's That's connected. It is. Genesis chapter 3 is when the devil first shows up. Okay. And verse number 1, he says, um, I, I'm, I'm doing this from my mind. It don't have to be up here. He says, did the Lord really say no, didn't the Lord say you could not eat of every tree in the garden? That's the deception of the devil. I've told you this before. I hope you remember it. He, what did the Lord actually say to him? You can eat of any tree in the garden except one. The devil said, didn't the Lord tell you you couldn't eat of every tree in the garden? Do you see the difference? Devil made it sound like you can't eat out of any tree. But the Lord really said you can have them all, but just one you can't eat out of. But the devil flips things around. And so the first thing he does, I believe Sister Kim said it or something to that effect, he gets you, this is the doctrine of devils. This is how he's going to get you away from the faith by seducing you. All right, he can't seduce you if you're not attracted. He ain't seducing OG money with a, with a bottle of uh, uh, Old Crow. That's what my friend Bobby always tells me he's going to give me. He ain't going to seduce me with a case of Paps Blue Ribbon. All right? The enemy is only going to seduce us with something we're attracted to. Every man sins when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Okay, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Hey, Pastor, I just got a question. Uh-huh. Like oh, that's what it is. So it's the same. You won't... The paradox of deception is, is when you are deceived, you think you're right. That's, that's, that's what happened, is the devil convinced, watch this what happens. Okay, first thing he does in verse number one of Genesis three is he gets you to question the word of God. Okay, question the word. Verse number four, he tells Eve, I'm paraphrasing, God lied to you. He just told you that in verse 5 because he wanted to hold you back. You could have a full life if it wasn't for all these rules God made for you. It's in the book. You can read it for yourself, but I, I just wrote this down a little bit ago, so I didn't have time to print it all off for you and stuff. Question the word of God. The devil will take doctrine of devils. That's what we're talking about, all right? The teaching of the devils. 
question the word of God, openly declare that it's wrong, God's a liar, and the reason God lied was to limit you, hold you back. And verse number six, when you know you're deceived is when you agree with him. Because can, can, uh, can you give me verse number six? I know it's, it's going to throw you way out of your, I want you, I want you to know, because this is an incredible picture. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Listen, old girl was already attracted by the tree before the devil started talking. But now she's agreeing with him. Look here. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes. And the devil told her, it's going to make you like God. Remember, he's limiting you. He's holding you back. She's done, she's believing. Man, Brother David, I could preach right now. She's believing every tenet the devil told her that all violated the word of God. And she knows that she is only in existence because God put her in that garden. Her and Adam have had an up-close and personal relationship with God. He comes in the cool of the day and visits with them. She knows good and well she was created from the side of Adam. But she has done hopped into bed with the devil. And he only was able to get her because she was trapped by her own desire first. He'll get you to, to, to doubt the word. He'll tell you God lied to you. God is trying to hold you back. You need to be set free from bondage. And you will agree with everything he said. And unfortunately, when you depart from the faith, very rarely do you go down by yourself. But you take somebody with you. What does departing from the faith and listening to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, what does it look like? What does leaving the faith and listening to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils look like? Miss Jane, you said it earlier. Everything opposite of Jesus Christ. Everything. It's coming in the latter days. I said it's coming and it will be evident. What we're teaching, our world has fallen prey to the deception of the enemy. Uh, I'm not picking on the women, okay? I'm not. If, if you've been around here long enough, you'll find out that as a pastor, I require more out of men than I do out of women as far as making the relationship right. You come to talk to me, husband and wife, you men better have on the whole armor of God and pack a lunch because we're going to war. It's true. Because I'm going to double barrel you. Because most of the time when the home got out of line, it's because the priest wasn't doing his job. The world has taught you and is teaching you. Ladies, that the only way you can get a man is through your sexuality. Yeah. 
And you want to know why 52% and climbing of all marriages end in divorce? Is because they got started on a lie. Shallow. Don't get uncomfortable. This is all in the book. Part of the trouble in our world is that we teach our kids to not lie, to not play in the street, to not hold firecrackers too close to their hand, but we don't talk about this stuff. We don't talk about it, but we got to. Because, lady, you are a whole lot more than what goes on in the nighttime. Might have made us just a little nervous, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Okay. Um, I got. I, I done lost my place. Okay. We're going to talk about the scripture. The Bible does not condemn all jewelry. Men such as Judah. Genesis 38, Joseph, Genesis 41, Mordecai, Esther 8, Saul, 2 Samuel 1, Daniel, Daniel chapter 5 and verse 29, they wore jewelry. However, in each case, the jewelry had a functional use. Signet rings were used to transact business. Crowns, chains, and bands were used to convey legal authority. The high priest's breastplate of precious stones had a similar function in Israel's worship. And I, I'm going to preach this someday, but it, ha, ha, have you read that? That the 12 tribes were on the priest's garment and he carried the burden of the people before God? Huh? Jewelry also had a functional use as a wedding token in biblical times. Genesis 24, Isaiah 61, and Jeremiah chapter number 2. Because the Bible does not condemn these various types of functional jewelry in the Old Testament, we maintain a balanced position by making allowance for a minimal amount of functional jewelry, such as wedding rings, wrist watches, hair clips, etc., while maintaining God's desired prohibition on jewelry for the sole purpose of adornment. If you do it to make yourself attractive, you got your heart in the wrong place. Okay. Look at the world we live in. I saw it again. I'm referencing it yesterday. But in a more urban area, people are putting jewelry all over their entire bodies. Why? I have a feeling. I have a, an explanation for it. Because they want to be seen, Brother Blake. Not in a neck. Ah. Not altogether in a negative connotation. But people are saying, I want to matter. I want people to notice me. I want people to see me. And that works. That works. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. You want to make an impact in your world? I, we prayed it on Saturday. I should have left my, my papers up there, but I do them with blue tape and my wife don't like it. She said it looks ugly. But we pray, Mark chapter 16 and verse number 16. These signs shall follow them that believe. If you begin to operate under the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost uh, in accord with the word of God, you won't have to add anything to your life to make an impact in the world uh, and people will notice you because you'll be praying for people on the job and they'll get healed. You'll pray people at the grocery store and they'll get healed. You will not have to conform yourself to the world's ideal of attention. If you do what God called you to do. Matter of fact, you won't even worry about it. Ooh, Lordy. You won't spend an hour putting your face on. Because you can't wait to hit the road. Because you know God has put somebody in your path that you're going to make a difference in their life. It's, it's so true. Y'all can be happy. Y'all can be happy in the Holy Ghost. The apostolic admonitions of Peter and Paul are even more explicit than the Old Testament commands because the New Testament repeatedly contrasts the inner adorning of a meek and quiet spirit. And Brother David, meek is not a bad word. 
It's a good word. Meek and quiet spirit, they contrast that with the outer adorning of the body by elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, and costly attire. These are two different lifestyles. There is one that all you have is the outward adorning. But there is one who recognizes that the inner adorning of the Spirit of God creates within you a power and an affluence, an influence, as it were, where you make a difference in your world. 1 Peter 3, 3 through 4, who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair. I remember I told you that's weaving gold and jewels through your hair and a wearing of gold or a putting on of apparel. You do not establish your identity by how much worldliness you can attach to your body. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Nobody ever says, look at that tramp. She's got the sweetest spirit of anybody I've ever heard. <laughs> y'all don't act all, all holy. Y'all know good and well y'all been sitting in McDonald's and some old gal walked in there and you wanted to put your hand over your husband's eyeballs <laughs> or your son's eyeballs. You failed keeping it away from your son because he saw her when she got out of the car. <laughs> Husband probably did too, but he's going to play it off. I ask you this question. Let it be the hidden man of the heart. Let the Spirit of God working inside of us establish our identity in that which is not a corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. What's my heart look like? What does my heart look like? What does my heart look like? 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Honey, you don't have to be pretty according to the world standard because the world standard is going to change tomorrow. That's the, that's the, think, think about it. Look, look at, 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 uh, at the, I, I was talking to somebody today about something. Everything in the whole entire world ain't cool no more someday. You know something, Brother David? I almost held on to my double-breasted suits till they came back in. <laughs> Everything in the world, the world is the most fickle thing in the, that exists. Both Peter and Paul expect women to adorn themselves so long as it is done properly. God does not condemn natural ornaments. He could have designed all the fruits and vegetables to be green, but he didn't. He created them in a variety of colors so that they not only give us food, but also beauty. Ain't that right, Brother Robert? In case you ain't been by the produce stand, he's got some of the prettiest squash. He's got yellow squash. He's got bright yellow squash. He's got green squash. He's got white squash. He is, it is beautiful. I don't know about that yet. God does not expect us to be drab or colorless in appearance, but he does expect us to be godly. There must be a consistency between the inward life and the outward appearance of a Christian. To pretend to come humbly before God while we are adorned in, adorned in a way he does not like is hypocrisy. The, the point of this message, I said it in the beginning, I'll say it right now. Ain't no holiness police at the river bend. If you don't get this stuff, keep coming. 
If somebody's mean to you, they're going to have to meet me in a cage match. Okay? I'm serious as a heart attack. We're not going to mistreat people. We're not going to be ugly to people. We are not going to look down on people. If you're prideful and arrogant and haughty and pharisaical, you're probably not going when the trumpet sounds. We done covered that at the very beginning of this. But there is a call from the word of God and the Holy Ghost, and I feel the anointing in this house, to a deeper consecration. There is a call to greater conviction and standing upon biblical and godly and holy principles that will aid you, that will be accessories to you, finding out who God made you to be. You can't become who God made you to be while you're trying to latch on to what the world's got to offer. Let it go, baby. Turn it loose because God can't put something in your hand that's holding on to something else. Whatever's behind you, let it go and reach for what's before of you. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be intimidated by it. Don't run it through the filter of self-preservation. Don't run it through the filter of People Magazine or Us Weekly or Yahoo or YouTube or TikTok, but run it through the Word of God and become who you can be for Jesus Christ in every way. That's what this is about, is becoming who God made you to be. He didn't make you to look like the Kardashians. He didn't make you to look like the real housewives. He made you to look like Jesus Christ. And affect your world the same way. Apologies to the Kardashians and the real housewives. They need Jesus. Oh, God, help me right now. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. There's a call to consecration. And if you're not careful, you'll get distracted because you can't wear your halter top and cut off up you know where to. No more. Really. Don't get hung up on what you can't do. Get a picture in your mind of what you can do. Sister Meredith texted me today. She ain't in here, is she? Y'all may not believe this, but it was very powerful what she texted me. Very spiritual and very holy. Somebody that she's connected to is going to another country to a very prestigious religious place. And they have been told before they come don't come into this place without sleeves in your top and don't wear a dress above your knees. And if I called the name of this religion, every last one of you would know it because it is the largest religion on the planet, arguably. But they got, I was at Bent Creek the other day. They got a sign in the window. That's a golf course. They got a sign in the window that said, anybody you fellas see that sign in the window? What did it say, Brother Larry? It said, don't come out on this course in a T-shirt. There was nobody holding up a sign out front saying, give us our rights. If you want to play the course, you line up with their standards. I, I want to be pleasing to Jesus Christ. I want to make a difference in my world. I don't just want to be a church goer. And I cannot be who he wants me to be when I don't even know who I am. Because I let the world establish my identity. They want to establish it on everything. Hair color, hair style, hair length, Bosom size, booty size, clothes you got on. I'm just telling you, they, wanna, they want to tell you everything that's attractive according to the world standard. And then people are going to pay millions of dollars to look like the world says they need to look. And, and we got a problem? Y are y'all feeling me right now? It's happening in the world all the time. 
I'll never forget talking to that young lady, and she's beautiful. If I told you who she was, a great portion of you would know her. She is a beautiful, one of the prettiest women around. And I'll never forget. And she looked at me in my face, and she was distraught. Tears were flooding down her face. And she said, I'm so ugly. I look so bad. I've got to have this fixed. I've got to have other parts fixed because I don't look like this and I don't look like this. And she was not playing, Brother Shannon. It's heartbreaking. You know what I could do to help her, Brother Christian? Nothing. Because her standards had already been set. And they were unreachable. Is this all right, Brenton? Yes, great. You better be glad you said that. <laughs> all right, we got just a few minutes. Let's talk about painting it up. Makeup. The painting of the face and eyes is directly connected to vanity. According to our text, oh, it's going to get worse. Just get ready or better, whatever your flavor. Women should adorn themselves with shamefacedness and sobriety. Now, the best way to define shamefacedness and sobriety for us is tell you what the opposite of it is. Drawing attention to yourself. You should not present yourself in a way that says, I want people to look at me. According to the Bible, shamefacedness and sobriety. It deals with attitude more than it even does appearance. And it manifests itself in respect, reverence, self-restraint, modesty, and, everybody say and, and, bashfulness toward men. Okay. Makeup is designed for one purpose make women more attractive to men. It is designed to accentuate the sensuality in the woman, which is in direct contrast to what God desires for the chaste, modest, and natural attractiveness for a woman. God intended for a woman to have natural adornment, and society has replaced it with an unnatural one. Here we go. Makeup. Think about it. It's going to be true. It might hurt our feelings a little bit, but it's going to be true. Here's where it came from. I'm not even going to unpack completely where it came from because I said that before in church, and some people it's a little too real for them of where it came from. Now, I want to make this also very clear. Everybody that wears makeup is not doing it for this reason. Okay? All right. But makeup has a connection between the ancient art of prostitution. Flushed cheeks, hooded or shadowed eyes, swollen lips, all were designed to present a woman in a state of sexual arousal. I'm looking at you fellas because y'all ain't been doing it. Sometimes you look like you might have got some of that red stuff. <laughs> but that's just natural adornment. Y'all see it now? <laughs> Y'all see it now? That's, what it, that's where it came from. That's where it got its start. That's what it is. Originally, that's, that's what... Think about this just for a minute. Who decided... Now, now they can give all kinds of scientific reasons and all that, but at the end of the day, that's where it got its start. Right. Right. Yeah. To make someone look like they want you. Okay. God help me, Jesus. <laughs> Biblically, the prophets are consistent in their portrayal. I'm, I'm bringing it home in their portrayal of a backslidden Israel as an unfaithful woman decked with jewelry and makeup. Hosea chapter 2, verse number 13. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, 
wherein she burned incense to them. Idolatry. There we go. And she decked herself with ear, her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, saith the Lord. That, that's not a picture that's hard to see. Hosea 2 and 13. Jeremiah 4 and 30. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou clothest... Man, I can't talk very good tonight. I'm just real nervous. Though thou, <laughs> though thou clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair or pretty or attractive, because your lovers will despise you, they will seek thy life. And, I, and what I saw when I read that is they were operating on an unwinnable plane. The arena they had stepped into, they were ill-equipped to wrestle with. Ezekiel 23 and 40. And furthermore, that you have sent for men to come from afar. You enticed them. You called them. Unto whom you sent a messenger and said, come get you some. And lo, they came. For whom thou did watch thyself. That has to do with putting perfume and stuff on. Paintest thy eyes and deckest thyself with ornaments. And then there's the queen, Jezebel. Jezebel's look verified her spiritual standing and her vision, which was to seduce Israel into idolatrous worship. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 22. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? Now, Jehu is the king that's replacing Ahab. Peace there means complete, safe, sound, health and prosperity. And Jehu answered Joram, and he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. That word whoredoms comes from the original word fornication, but actually means idolatry. Worshiping at another altar and her witchcrafts. What's that talking about? You know what it's in the Bible? Rebelliousness. You're not going to have peace as long as idolatry and rebellion are running rampant. There can be no peace. Verse 30, 2 Kings 9 and 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard it. She heard that the king was coming. Are you all ready? And she painted her face and tired her head, which means she wrapped jewels and gold all around her hairdo and looked out at a window. See, can anybody see that picture? Just imagine, if you will. There's a window, and there she sits. She's way up there but she has painted a picture of what she wanted Jehu to see. She has made herself in a way that has worked before. A picture designed to seduce him. She knew what that rascal was coming for. And she thought, I can change him. Because when he gets a look at me, he won't even remember why he came here. Except he's going to put his Ray-Bans on, flip the collar of his black leather jacket up. He's going to step out of that chariot, and he's going to make his way up them stairs to where sweet mama is. Anybody think she had anything else on her mind but that? Done brought one king down. I same way, I'll do it again. Remember, there's actually something to that because I believe that she was, if you'll look at I believe that she was desiring to look at and be at that effect. You know, we like to make her out to be a clown a lot of times. Nah, she, she was one hot mama. <laughs> I believe, that because I she believe had, it. She had that effect. She had, oh man, she had stuff going for her. And I don't believe Jehu was immune to her charms. 
There we go. That's why he stayed in the chariot and he looked up in the window because there was some servants with it, Jezebel, and they were eunuchs. And Jehu called to the eunuchs and said, throw her down. And they did. You want to know why? Anybody not know what a eunuch is? A eunuch is a man that can't be attracted to a woman no more. Is that plain enough for you? He got his... Yeah, y'all want to say it. Mm, y'all nasty. Y'all want to get me in trouble. Because if I say it, everybody's going to be mad at me. They took away his manhood. True. A eunuch is a male who no longer has the ability to have sexual attraction. And they put him in charge of the treasure. And, oh, I could preach this now. I could preach this. They put him in charge of things where people tended to be corruptible. Because when you lose your sexual desire, you can come into line. And Jehu hollered up to the eunuchs and said, throw her down. And you know why they could? Because the prettiness, the sexiness, uh, hot mama didn't have no effect on them. It's true. Look it up. 2 Kings chapter 9. Now there's no longer a negative connotation associated with jewelry and makeup in our culture. But our desire must be to please God and not man. Society doesn't influence the principles of God. He doesn't change his principles according to cultures. Nor do they eliminate the spiritual principles for these biblical prohibitions. When God says not to do something, there's a reason for it. And Sister Maria, the reason is he wants to protect us, not hurt us. It's safe. Makeup and jewelry still highlight sensuality. We were having a conversation on the construction site one day. I can say his name because he's dead and gone now. Blaine worked for us. And old Blaine was particular about everything. Anybody ever done construction in here? When Blaine, well, not very many, Brother Kevin. When we were pouring concrete, Blaine tried to set the forms to a 32nd of an inch. There you, you, know what that, you know what that is. You ain't doing it. Okay, he was particular about everything. And he was sitting at, the, at the, the dinner table there one day, and he was bragging. I, I don't understand that. I, I really don't understand this. But he said, I've been married to my wife I don't know how many years, and I have never seen her without her makeup on. He said, she makes me turn out the light before she comes to bed after she takes her stuff off because she doesn't want me to see her without that on. And he was bragging about it. Well, daddy, y'all don't know my daddy, but some of you do, but not many, and it's your loss. He was an incredible man. He's sharp as a tack. So he asked Blaine, How, how's that a cool deal? Well, I don't want to see her if she ain't looking pretty. I don't want to see her if she ain't got herself all together. And daddy looked at him as serious as a heart attack and said, Blaine, what in the world makes you think that you're so pretty you couldn't use a little help? <laughs> think about the hypocrisy. Huh? Think about that. You know what he had to say after that? Nothing. Nothing. Uh huh. <laughs> I, I, I hear what you're saying, but that's pitiful too. I, I mean, what's that? 
There, there you go, yeah. But, but think about that. What an insult. But not only is it insulting, but now women have become to feel like less than when they're like God made them. That they got to be something more for you. I don't know about the whole world, but apostolic men have got to validate our women. We've got to let our ladies know that they look beautiful, just like God made them, that we love them, that we value them, and they are more than just what you can see. They got a mind and they got a heart and they got an anointing and they got a gifting. In the bedroom is not their place of most value. I know you ain't supposed to talk about that in church, but we do around here. And I've talked about it so much, they ain't even hardly embarrassed no more. Makeup and jewelry still highlight sensuality, encourage pride. They affect both the wearer and the viewer. Watch some little sweetie pie when she gets her new engagement ring and comes to church. And she can't wait till the spirit moves. Bam! <laughs> Y'all know I ain't lying. She walks in the door with her hands up and she don't put them down till she gets back in the car. I know that's a little funny and facetious, but it illustrates my point. When we got something that we, make th we think increases who we are, we want everybody to see it because it will increase their opinion of who I am. But Brother Brennan, God don't roll like that because he ain't interested in my baubles. He ain't interested in my paint. He ain't interested in how much I got in my billfold. He ain't interested in what I'm driving. He ain't interested in the house I'm living in. He's interested in what's in here. Because, you see, he put me in this world to make a difference in the world, not to become a chameleon. But he put us here. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me as I tell you, this is not hyperbole and this is not preacher speak. But let me tell you that there are a multitude of men and women who watch our service every Sunday and every Wednesday after the credits roll. That's because you can't tell who's on there after the last amen. And the reason is they're hungry for something that changes them. They're hungry for something that challenges them. They're hungry for something that gives them purpose uh, more than just to show up and drop something in the plate. Uh, but they can become an anointed man or woman of God. They make a difference in their world. And that's what God called you for. That's what he created you for. That's what he made you for. The Bible tells us very clearly that makeup and jewelry have given us a distorted value system. The world is hiding behind a mask. The way God feels about adornment is very clear. Now think about this just for a minute. I want you to think about this just for a minute. And the negative spiritual effects of the world system is very clear in our world. The world's way of doing things has not made us better. The only thing going to help the world is Jesus Christ. <laughs> and the only way the world is going to see him is in us. Oh, uh, but in, in three minutes it'll be eight thirty. I want to talk about something. It's been in the in the it's been in the uh, um, what is this called? The bulletin. I, I'm just excited about being in church. I, and when the anointing wears off, I'm just like other men. <laughs> just teasing. 
and I have trouble reading. I'm going to have to upgrade my prescription again, I think. But anyway, the YMCA, anybody familiar with it in Sykester? It's an incredible organization. It's run by some incredible people. And uh, I think we even have some that are members there, go to the gym and, and what have you. But they're exploring the possibility of coming to New Madrid in some way, shape, or form. We don't know what that all looks like yet. Uh, I know the city council and the mayor and, and previous mayor, Donnie Brown, who's now our state representative, our vision is a building. Probably not on the scale of the one at Sykeston, but in a very similar setting. All right, I know there will not be a pool, and the YMCA said they don't want no more pools. Okay, I'm cool with that. But that's, that's our plan. That's our vision. Do not go out of here and tell anybody that that's what's coming because I'm not telling you that. But that's what we'd like to have happen. But June the 19th through July the 28th, the YMCA is coming to New Madrid, and they're going to have something called a summer blast, which is um, children, um, kindergarten through the fourth grade, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Two meals. They stay there the whole time. There's planned activities. It's highly organized. It will be at the community building. It is, has limited enrollment. But the reason why I'm coming to you is we want to make our community better. Amen? And YMCA as an organization makes your community better. Uh, Brandy, who is, I think, I don't know her title, um, some of you might have went to school with her. She's from Lilburn, but she is over the, she's something high up at the YMCA. I think her name was Brandy Keith uh, when she was coming up. And, um, but she's a very nice lady, very uh, articulate. And uh, she, she met the, the, the Rotary Club and, and the Mayor's Association. And I raised my hand at it, and along with some other folks, and help get the ball rolling because now don't lose your breath when I tell you this, but 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, that's 11 hours a day. They're willing to provide um, a day camp for children, kindergarten through fourth, limited enrollment, but it costs $90 a week. That is cheap, folks, for that much. Unfortunately, Many people can't afford it. So we begin to discuss, I believe in the city of New Madrid. I believe the river bend is a microcosm of what can happen in New Madrid. We have people driving to our church from no less than 17 different communities every service. Okay? We are running very nearly 200 people through here every week, Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights and Thursday nights, okay? The River Bend has made an impact in our community. There are people talking about our church that it would blow your mind if I told you who they were. There are many, many people in this town, especially mature ladies, who go to their church by passing by our church every day. Because they want to see. One of them called or told me I run into her. She said, I can't stop counting all the cars. <laughs> okay? They've never been here before. But the River Bend has made a positive impact in this community. And, and so what they have sent me, I don't have it for you tonight. I just want you to think about it. But for uh, uh, $2,500, $1,000, or $500, there are three levels of sponsorship that we can provide scholarships for children to go to this day camp if they can't afford it. Now, now let, let me tell you, it, it, there are state subsidies because it's income-based. All right? So when you go on the, the – have you all seen the banners, one on Main Street and one somewhere else? I forgot where, Scott Street. Um, but it's, it's in our the, – the thing is in our bulletin, and you can, you can take a picture of the little thing with your phone and go to it. And, uh, but uh, here's my point. We can't have the YMCA wanting to come to New Madrid and not have a full capacity of kids out there for their day camp. Y'all feel me? Okay. And if money is a problem, 
we do not, I, and I hope you buy into that vision, I don't believe that scholarship money for a YMC day camp is a cost. I believe it's an investment. So I want you to be thinking about it by Sunday because uh, we have a link. We can do it. The, the commitment doesn't have to be made. I do know that we are going to make a commitment. I just don't know how much. You're going to help me decide that. But it, does anybody know what YMCA stands for? Okay. It is a very strong faith-based organization. And if they want to come to New Madrid, we want them here. Amen. Amen. Are y'all with me? I feel it's a little lukewarm. Uh, I mean, really. Uh, they, they are starting the possibility. How many of you know it's hard to find a babysitter in New Madrid? Okay, it's very difficult to find a daycare in New Madrid. Uh, they are formulating a plan right now to have an after-school program starting in August. That every day, that would be incredible. Y'all know what after-school is? I mean, your kids leave school and go there. And you don't have to worry about them while you're finishing up work. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say that Lake Shore Day Camp is going to be really fun. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be a great opportunity for the young people to get involved with the youth ministry. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's all very strong, very positive, and it's going to be a great opportunity for the youth ministry. She's a very dynamic lady. Yeah, she does. Her whole speech was basically about faith and about Christianity and putting good values into these kids. So uh, we want you to think about it. We'll talk about it on Sunday. I'm going to leave my sign up here that says, talk about the YMCA. <laughs> and don't nobody bust into no village people. <laughs> Stuff. Yeah. Stand with me. Let's look at Brother Johnny in rebellion up here on the front row. He automatically went. Uh, she did too? Yeah. We know what they was teaching at the Henry household. I'm glad one of them, one of them came out of there holy. So, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. She was probably singing it while they did the, the, they did the signs. I love you all. This is an incredible church. God is doing great things in this church. To all of our guests, thank you for coming. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we have Elements, which is an incredible gathering over in the Family Center. And uh, at 11 o'clock, we have some throw-down worship. You don't want to miss it. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm happy. I want to say, uh, last night, the ladies had a night over here. And everybody is invited. And most generally, they don't cost you very minimal cost. Every lady is invited. Okay? But they had a wonderful time. Uh, I encourage you, when we, when we announce that there's going to be another ladies' night, come to it. Come to it. it you, I mean, you need to, you get to, I mean, Sister Nadine did a fashion show. <laughs> and she put on some shoes. And my mama got a pair of blue jeans that would fit me in her secret. Yeah. I don't know that they would fit me. I just saw my mom holding them up. I'm just being facetious. But somebody is? Oh, my. They wouldn't fit me then. They wouldn't fit me. But I was just being funny. I was just being funny. But uh, they had a great night. They had a great night. And, uh, and I had the leftovers for lunch today. I don't know if that's against the rules or not, but I did it. And I only didn't have but one, not one plate. I had two of them. And they were good too. So I uh, appreciate everybody that helps do that. God, we love you tonight. You've been really good to us. Your word is true. It's powerful. It's rich. You want better for us. You're always calling us to a higher plane, a higher level, a deeper level of consecration. I pray, Lord, that the things we've said tonight, we're not looking for everybody to just, just, just start making a bunch of changes because they think it's what the preacher wants, but I want them to prayerfully 
pursue you, Lord. Pursue consecration and, and open our lives up, God. It, none of us are, are arrived yet. We need to all say, turn the light on us. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's got to be our motto, our creed that we live by. Thank you for the river, Ben. Thank you for what you're doing in the river, Ben, and what you're yet to do. Thank you for revival. I ask that you bless everybody, give them a safe trip going home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.